on this edition of the Self Publishing Show. We accept less than less than five percent. I think it's around three percent of people who want to be listed on Reedsy. So it's wow. It's very selective, and we make a lot of people angry. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self Publishing Show, show number two hundred and ninety-nine. Would you believe? With me, James Blatch, and me, Mark Dawson. We should say straight away, we are planning a little special episode for number 300. It seems like a milestone worth marking. Mark? Marky Mark? Mark? It does, yes. Yeah, 300 episodes. That's what, five years, pretty much. Just under five years. <laughs> oh, Great. my God. Yes. Never miss an episode. <clears throat> Never miss an episode. I think you, neither, I think you have us. missed an episode. Have I? Yeah, I you think sure? I recorded a couple with Tom in New York, and you weren't there. Oh, yes, you're right. Yeah, you're right. You did. Um, yeah. And uh, and there's been a couple of occasions when you've, in fact, you've had a bit of a technical day today, but a couple of occasions when I thought, do I have to phone up John Dyer? Because it's, no, it's time, never for his, that <laughs> time for his debut on the podcast. Um, he could do uh, he could do Indian John all the way through it. And that would probably be the last podcast we ever do. It was, That's, yes. We'll get cancelled. Yeah. Um, we anyway, uh, let us, uh, without doing anything else, First, let us welcome our new Patreon supporters. They've been to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show to support the podcast. And they are Catherine Karen from New York in the United States of America, Charles Mann from Devon here in the UK, and Kate Rice. So Catherine, Charles, and Kate, thank you very much indeed for supporting the podcast. Um, I'm going to do, I'm trying to do, and trying to get it done in time, a little behind the scenes uh, I've been a couple of people have asked recently to explain how we put the podcast together. I know lots of people are interested in that because they tend to create their own content and I'm doing a little behind the scenes also just so that people are aware how many people are involved in getting each episode out and give a shout out to our behind the scenes team so I'll try and get that done for episode 300 and we'll do a bit of a look back then. Mark we should say that self-publishing 101 uh, is open for business it's open for the last time this year last time until probably spring next year in 22 and you've got a couple of weeks to uh, to sign up, go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 101. And again, we've kept it going, the COVID two-year plan to make it as affordable as possible for everybody. We have, yeah. It was quite nice. I saw the other day in the community, someone asked, com completely unprompted, um, we weren't even tagged, they just asked w whether 101 was, was a worthy investment. And the response was really lovely from people saying they've gone from, you know, making... 50 or 60 dollars a day to making i think it was five or between five and ten thousand a month was one one response um but just generally people being very nice about the course which is always pleasing to see because it is you know we, we work quite hard putting that course together and we still work hard to make sure that it's up to date and and fit for purpose so it's it's nice to see people getting good value from it yeah Good. Okay, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 101. And there's a page there that has all the information you need. It's a very detailed description of the course. I think, Mark, you go through it, don't you, in a video. Um, and you get a strong idea of whether it's going to be a good fit for you. Okay, I know you're busy releasing books at the moment. Is your Milton book out? Is it next week it's out? Um, well, as we're recording this the week before, um, it is out in paperback now. It will be out on Monday um, on the other channel so the non-amazon channels and then it goes live on amazon i think it's the 10th of october but i'll probably bring that forward a little bit okay um, so it might be out so, by this i think this is the 8th of october this is going out so. yeah it could it could be out so i mean it's been it's been a good um good launch period over ten thousand pre-orders i think well yeah actually nearly eleven thousand now um so that's great um the ads are running now so those have those have started to work quite well um and yeah, it's it's been um it's been a good one. I think people are quite looking forward to it. Um, the twentieth in the series and kind of brings some some brings the characters full circle, which is was quite fun to do. Mm. And um, yeah, I'm no no rest. I've jumped straight into the next one now. So uh, as I this is my research for the next one. Ah uh, ah. Uh, holding us, of course, people won't know what you're ahhing about. It's uh, midnight yes. in Chern <laughs> Chernobyl. So. Yeah, I'm doing a, a book I've been thinking of for a, a couple of years, actually, about um, 
the Chernobyl nuclear reactor accident. So I'm actually learning about nuclear physics at the moment, which is quite interesting. Mm. And, and above my pay grade, so I'm certainly struggling that does a sound bit. Sort of book I read and factual book about uh, the Chernobyl disaster. Yeah, it's um, very interesting. And Bond is out in the UK, maybe worldwide mm. as well this week. I'm not sure, but mm. um, causing a lot of good, very positive news. We'll go and see it next week, I think, when yeah. the crowds have died down. Lots of positive reviews and discussion, as there always is, about whether Bond should be more diverse in the future. So uh, one of the prominent politicians in the UK suggested it should be played by a woman. Bond should be played by a woman next time. And usual discussions about um, about diversity. Is this something that you think about with Milton? No, of course not. No. I mean, and, and most of the female commentators I've seen I t- take the entirely understandable route, which is, the, I think, the right answer is that no, Bond should not be a woman. Um, he was written to be a man. What we need is more really strong female characters to be created. You know, there's an onus on writers and filmmakers to create strong roles for women um, and, and and everyone, uh, rather than trying to retrofit something, which always feels a little bit too PC for my my taste. Um, but it would, be, a, it would be odd just on the basis that if, you, if Bond was a woman, it wouldn't be James Bond, it'd be another character, right? It has to be because you, unless you're mm. talking about trans, which I don't think he was talking about because otherwise he would have said man, so you're talking about a female character, a female actor playing James Bond. So the character becomes a female. So it's no longer James Bond. Yeah, the writers would have to have James Bond in the background or something. Oh, yes. So it makes no sense. A, no, in a very literal way, it doesn't. But I mean, you could you could create a female character based on, in the same way that, you know, Thor, in the new in the new Thor movie, um, Love and Thunder, I think it's called, um, Natalie Portman plays Lady Thor. So and yeah. that, that was, uh, it's, it's easily very... Not really. Uh, it's very easy to, um, to to do that, to take a character, characteristics of a character and then... Um, yes, and that's what gen- they should do. Gender. Right. You know, there's 100% there's, there's a market for... Well, uh, I haven't read your Isabella books. I don't know quite how they, they fit in, but it's 100%, mm. I would say, the market for a strong female undercover agent operating in... No, it's Beatrice. Yeah, that's, that's, it's why Beatrice. I wrote that, that's why I wrote that character. And, and that's and that's the reason, I think, why... She, rather than Milton, has had the most interest um, in in a film adaptation um, mm. because filmmakers know that there is there's definitely a market for that kind of kick ass female character that we saw in Atomic Blonde with Charlize Theron and um, and and films like that. Uh, there's definitely room for that, but it doesn't it doesn't need to be Jane Bond. It, that, that that that's just I think that's stupid. Um, Jane Bond. <laughs> Yeah, that's what people are talking about. You know, it yeah. could be, be James, it be Jane Bond. On, on her no, secret cervix. Oh, my God. Accidental <laughs> partridge. <laughs> I was going around you know, on not, social media. Not even accidental. <laughs> yeah, I was going <laughs> around on social media. I can't claim credit for that one. Anyway, um, always fun to have these discussions, and uh, I will go and see the Bond film. And as always, with writers now, you kind of watch the film, you enjoy it, you also think, how does this story work? How's it put together? As I think a lot about that, as I'm currently still drafting book number two. Um, okay, right. I think it's time for us to move on to our interview, Mark, which is Ricardo Fayette, a great friend of self-publishing formula. Ricardo is one of a team of four uh, who founded Reedsy, whose names I think I can remember because I didn't know the other two, but it's Emmanuel and Ricardo, and I think Matt and a French name. Oh, I can't remember. It might be Louis, something like that. It's is Francoise. Fr- yeah, yeah, who knows? Yeah, um, no. I'm making that up. René, yeah. René um, yeah. is number four. But the four of them founded Reedsy. Reedsy is a marketplace for expertise that indie authors in particular will like. Actually, traditional publishing probably uses Reedsy as well these days. It's a fantastic curated marketplace of experts. I have personally found editors of every description, development editor, and proof at Reedsy, and I've been hugely satisfied with the service they've provided, and I thoroughly recommend it. I say that without any hesitation. More importantly, and more personally for us, is that Reedsy came on board with the SPF Foundation when he was approached by Lucy, uh, who runs the foundation, and has been a great supporter, a critical supporter of that foundation, which allows us to give grants to indie authors who otherwise can't afford to get their careers going. So let's have a chat with Ricardo, then Mark and I will be back for a, uh, a chat off the back. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Ricardo, Fayat, welcome back to the Self Publishing Show. It's been been a while. I think probably the last time we were in a room together might have been at Self Publishing Show Live, which was like three days before the world got locked down, wasn't it? 
Yeah, that's that's right. That's right. I remember those times. Yeah, it was crazy. When we think back to it, it was slightly crazy that we went ahead with that conference, but it was a, a slightly unreal moment. And I think it was the week. Uh, by the end of that week, it would have been unthinkable to have done it. And a week later, we were confined to barracks across Europe. And uh, anyway, we've been through the mill a little bit. And hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, touch wood, the vaccine is working and it's going to get us um, get us back to some semblance of normality. But in the meantime, the indie publishing world actually has gone from strength to strength. I don't know if you've you felt the same. This year might have been a bit slower than last year, but it's been a big growth period. Certainly that first 12 months of lockdown as people spent more time at home thought about alternative careers, thought about investing in their own education and so on. So how has it been from a Reedsy perspective? How has it, how's it impacted you? No, it's definitely, we've definitely seen that as well. Uh, I've heard of some, you know, great first time authors releasing their first book uh, during this period. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure about great, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, the, we've definitely seen a lot of, uh, a lot of growth. I mean, the first month, Obviously, uh, I think it was April, um, we were a little bit worried because I think the whole world stopped. Uh, so we, we saw a lot less activity on, on Ritzy's end uh, and we got a little bit worried, but then in May it picked up like crazy and we saw huge growth over the following months. Um, I think obviously there's people who started writing their book, but there's also a lot of people who had their book, you know, buried in, um, in a drawer. Uh, or who had left a project unfinished and they focused those first lockdown months on finishing it and shooting it off to the editor, which is, you know, when we on, on read season see the, the increase in activity. So, uh, so our editors, designers, et cetera, were definitely super busy during the, um, the first few lockdowns. And now it's, yeah, it's kept growing uh, at a slower rate, thankfully, but uh, it's kept growing and we see, I'm, I th I'm thinking we're starting to see the projects that got started during the first lockdown. Um, they're starting to to come to to life um, and being published. So yeah, it's definitely been a very very busy period and a um, and a good period in a way for indie publishing. Good. Well, we see the the continued growth of uh, the indie sector of publishing. Let's um, let's take a step back perhaps and um, and talk about Reezy itself. Talk about the company. So you are. If I could sum it up, you're a marketplace for expertise for uh, pr primarily for indie authors. That's right. Yeah, we're 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 a marketplace uh, where authors can hire pretty much anyone they would ever need to hire throughout their uh, writing career. So it starts with editors, proofreaders, cover designers. You know the basics. Uh, but then we also have illustrators for for children's books uh, or graphic novels. Um, book layout designers for more complex formats like again graphic novels or cuff table books things like that uh, we've got book marketers as well who are extremely busy uh right now um ghost writers we're seeing also more and more authors um, leveraging ghost writers and we added literary translators in the past year um, we've seen huge growth across all European markets uh, in terms of digital sales. So I think those markets are, are a little bit more ready now uh, than they were a few years ago. I mean, Germany has been ready for a few years now, but France, Spain, Italy, Portugal are catching up. Um, so we launched the trade translation with, uh, with some really, really amazing translators on the marketplace for those authors who are at that stage where they feel they can, you know, pursue uh, global markets. Yeah, that's actually one of the things I had a note down to talk to you about because in Reedsy, you're quite a European company. You're, I always hesitate to say what your nationality is, Ricardo, because I think you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of, um, a lot of Europe covered. European. Yeah, one way or another. But Emmanuel, I think, is French, who's one of your your co-founders, and no. I'm, not, I'm not sure I know who the other two are. I noticed on your notes it said four founders of Reedsy. Yeah, we're for the other two, you don't see them. Super often. Uh, there's Matt, who's our uh, lead designer, and he's British. And then there's Vincent, who's our CTO, and he's French. Okay. So, um, so yeah, mostly so, mostly French and British. Yeah. So that was interesting to me that it. My sense was certainly a couple of years ago that the United States, certainly the UK, uh, to a lesser extent, Australia and Canada, but Canada perhaps quite big. But it was, it was less prevalent the indie market, the ebook market in. France and Germany and Spain and so on. And I think that is changing. That's what you've alluded to. But um, it's interesting that Reedsy was, you know, you're, you may be, 
European and got your feet on the ground in France, but you were looking at this global phenomenon happening. It must be a relief to you to see it finally happening in across across Europe. Yeah, it's it's a relief and it's really interesting. Um, we're starting to see some authors making a living self-publishing in France. Uh, for me, the sign that a market is ready for self-publishing is when you start seeing the first few authors who make a, who make a living uh, out of it. Uh, I think there are, there's a, a small French contingent of the in, in, across the SPF groups. I think I've seen a few authors who self-publish in France in French and, and make a living out of it. I've met a few uh, German authors who do that as well, uh, a couple Italian authors as well. So we're seeing, starting to see those markets basically getting ready. Um, and I think the, the lockdown played a huge part because especially France, uh, Spain, Italy, they're very traditional markets uh, in terms of book buying habits. Uh, people go to bookstores, they still very much love the smell of paper, the touch of paper, all that stuff. Um, but of course, during the lockdown, it was much harder to get a hold of books and to buy them. So they started, even if they still bought print, they, they started buying print digitally uh, from stores like Amazon. And when you start doing that, these are places that indie authors can get into. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether you know they buy ebooks or prints, as long as they buy through a channel that indie authors can get uh, can get into. And so that's why I think those markets have grown um, for indie authors and have become accessible to indie authors over the past few years. Yeah, of course, that's very exciting for uh, for all authors, established ones, especially I would guess with backlists who can start to think about the translation side of things. Um, just before we talk about translation, is there a, is there an English speaking market growing in in those European countries? That's a good question. I actually don't know. No. I'm just wondering how, <laughs> I, how, how worth it would be to, to advertise your book in Germany, France, and Spain in English. I've heard of authors doing it. Um, it's, it's so cheap that it's worth a shot. What I've also heard is that as soon as you have uh, a book in that language, it instantly becomes a lot easier and obviously more, yeah. more cost-effective to advertise. So I think it's worth a shot, especially um, what I always say is like when you're considering translation, try to identify a pocket of readers in a country where, where you want to go into. Um, so if you have a pocket of readers in France, for whatever reason, who read your books in English, uh, then translating into French could be a good idea because you already have people on the ground who can tell their friends when the French edition is out, who can leave reviews on the French edition, who can even do beta reading of the French edition. Uh, so you've got kind of a street team on the ground in that country. Um, and one way to build that street team is uh, is advertising your English edition uh, on that country store. Um, yeah, so yeah, as a prelude to the translation. So moving on to translation right. then, it's, uh, it's a tricky area. Uh, you're, you're gifted in your linguistic talents. But for those of us who are not, it's a bit of a minefield having your book translated into other languages. You can't yourself check uh, yep. the quality. Yeah, it is. Um, I know a lot of authors are often are often worried about that. And I've seen Mark actually ask uh, on groups for people who spoke Spanish or German, et cetera, to check uh, the translations he was getting. Um, so the way we launched the translation segment on Ritzy was a little bit different to the other segments we have. Because when you're hiring, one thing we're really adamant about on Reedsy is having freelancers on there and not companies. So when you're hiring an editor on Reedsy, you're hiring that person. They're not going to subcontract it to someone else. Same thing for designers, et cetera. Um, for literary translators, I, I actually hunted, I actually looked for translators who would work in pairs. Uh, and most translators actually do that. They work with a colleague who then edits their translation. Because if, if as an indie author, you, you hire a translator to just do the translation, what they deliver to you is an unedited translation. And then you need to look for an editor in that language and a proofreader, and it complicates things a lot. So all the translators we have on Ritzy, they work in pairs uh, or in groups. And so they do the translation, but then they have a colleague who checks it, who edits it, and another one who proofreads it. And what they deliver is a fully edited translation that's ready to be formatted and uploaded to the stores. Uh, they can also, we've briefed them on helping authors translate their marketing materials, like the blurb, 
editorial reviews, um, advertising copy, et cetera. So there are people who, most of them are used by now to working within the authors, but even if they're not, we've briefed them on, on the requirements of working with, uh, within the authors. And, and also if you get your translation done outside of REITC, uh, like many people do, we have a service on there called translation assessment. Um, so not all our translators provide that, but if you, if you filter your search by that service, then you can find people to assess your existing translate translation. Um, so that gives you an extra, you know, an extra bit of peace of mind. And can you give us an idea of cost? You must see what the quotes, I mean, I say the way we Reedsy works is people give you a quote um, when you've put your services forward. So you don't set the price, but you must have an idea of the costs that are going, going, being quoted. Yeah, it turns out it depends a lot um, on the languages, um, on the translators. We see an average of between eight and 12, let's say eight and 10 cents per word. Um, so that's what I usually say budget 10 cents per word, uh, and you won't be too disappointed when the quotes come in. That's US dollar it, cents, not US dollar. Yeah. yeah. So it's simple. If you have an 80,000 word novel, I think it's going to cost you around 8,000 word, uh, $8,000, which is obviously quite the expense. Uh, you're going to find some translators on Reedsy who are going to, you know, charge less than that. Others who are going to charge more. Uh, we've got people charging up to 12 cents per word. Generally, those who charge more, they have more experience. They work with the bigger houses. They've got more big titles in their portfolio, uh, and maybe it's worth it for you in terms of like you know marketing. Saying you know, uh, the person who translated Dune into Spanish is doing my uh, the translation of my sci-fi series, for example. Yeah. You know, I'm not actually sure if we've got Dune's translator, but we've got titles like that. Yeah. Um, so that can be you know worth it in terms of uh, of of marketing afterwards. But it's up to you. Get some quotes and have this idea of like 10 cents per word is the average that we're seeing. Yeah, that's interesting. And is that completed job, as you say, the two people cross-checking and all your other little bits and pieces, your blurbs and, and front and back matter? That's right. Yeah, everything done. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it's audio book and translation, I think, are the two sort of big ticket items once your yeah. book is is out there and as a product to try and realize it. And um Probably if you're starting out like I am with my first book, writing my second, now's not a bad time to actually make that investment because if I'm in Mark's stage with 20 books out and you're starting to translate, you are looking at a huge amount of money to get 20 books done. I mean, 80 odd thousand dollars. Um, so to do them as you go along, once you've done them, they're done, aren't they? So that's the investment stage and the rest of it is marketing and, and recouping. But so, uh, yeah, interesting. I'm getting the audio book done. Nice. Uh, but uh, I am keen. I know Germany, for some reason, is uh, as interested in... Well, there is a group of people who are as interested in the kind of geeky Cold War aircraft uh, as I am. I think probably because there was a lot of American-British presence in Germany during the 60s and 70s and 80s. That's right. And um, I'm not sure it'll go down quite so well in, in Spain and Portugal, but Germany is definitely one that's on my radar, literally my Cold War radar, to uh, to think about <laughs> potentially... Hmm got the old thing i think i'll get the audiobook done first but i am a read yeah, customer uh ricardo as you know i have picked up my editor um proof editor copy editor and development editors from read and uh, i have a relationship with a development editor which i think will last me a few books he's certainly someone who's um become part of my team and i think that's the benefit of of Reedsy. You see so often people post into a group saying, can you recommend a proof editor or copy editor? And the reason they ask that is because they feel that personal recommendation is some sort of comfort blanket. But what I think Reedsy does is it gives you a level of security about previous work. And there's, I know there's a level of vetting that goes on. I couldn't just simply yeah. roll up tomorrow, could I, and declare myself a copy copy editor? No, we accept less than less than five percent. I think it's around three percent of people who want to be listed on Reedsy. So it's wow, it's very selective, and we make a lot of people angry. Um, so yeah, we have to deal with you know, <laughs> we have to deal with people who don't want to deal with rejection, uh, which is understandable. You know, mm. is that your um, job? It's, no, no, it used to be. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's not the best role uh, no. at Reedsy. But, you know, there are more things that go into that role as well. Uh, we're, we're creating more of a community among our editors. And and, and um, we basically, 
yeah, we want to make people feel that if they're accepted on retail as an editor, then they, they're part of really the the world's top professionals, which which is what we're aiming for. Um, but I mean, by now we have more than 2000 uh, editors on Reedsy. So we do have a lot of people in there. Um, and on top of all the advantages you mentioned, I think there's one that um, authors don't always think about is the ability to compare quotes because uh, the market is not very transparent. If you ask for recommendations, you might land on one editor who charges you maybe three thousand dollars, you know, uh, or no, or another one who charges you five hundred. What we found out is that the market is not transparent at all because you've got a lot of most of these people come from traditional publishing, so they were employees for all their life, maybe twenty, thirty years. Suddenly they go freelance, and it's very hard for a person like that to start uh, setting rates for awards for freelance projects. So some start very high, some start very low, and creates a lot of um, it creates a non-transparent market. We've we've published some average rates that we see on Reedsy, but we still see you know uh, everyone quoting a little bit what they want. So it's always nice to be able to compare quotes uh, and say, okay, um, this editor is going to charge me a lot less, so I might go with them. Or I see this editor is more expensive, but since they've edited this and that book for really close to mine, then I'm going to make the extra expense. But at least you make that extra expense knowing that you're making it. Um, right, rather than just this is the first quote I got and I accepted it. Yeah, and how's the company going overall? Um, are you are you seeing? Do you set yourself growth targets each year, and are you meeting them? Yeah, I mean it's it, it's hard to set growth targets with this this current period. Yeah. Uh, we definitely exceeded all growth targets uh, in 2020, uh, and in tw- and in the start of 2021 as well. Um, so then you set growth targets that are higher and maybe you don't meet them. So we don't, we tried to set some growth targets based on very historical data. Um, and yeah, so far we're, we're definitely meeting them. Um, now we're starting to see things maybe slow down a little bit, but I mean, second semester is always a little bit slower, you know, Thanksgiving, uh, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, these are all periods where people dedicate and rightfully so more time to their family to their friends rather than um, to their hobbies or their um, aspiring um, author career yeah and how many people do you make up Reedsy now obviously there's the four founders but you in directly employ people as well yeah we do we have around 35 people now who work wow. at Reedsy Wow. And they all work from home. They're spread around, are they? Rather than you don't have, there's no Reed THQ building in Madrid or something. Nope. Uh, no, the company is registered in England. So it's a, it's a British company. We've got quite a few people in England, maybe 10, 12 of them. Um, but the rest of the people are spread out through the globe. We, we have um, for customer service, for example, we try to have one person in each, who covers each major time zone so that we can give 24 hour customer support. Um, for other areas, it just depends on, you know, um, where, where the people who we hire are based. And that's also really great for hiring on our end because we're open to candidates from all over the globe. Yeah. Okay. So before I want to talk to you a bit about the, um, the foundation that you are very kindly a a co-sponsor of, uh, let's just talk to somebody who's not used your services before is listening to this for the first time how do they go about have you got any top tips for how they would go about getting a professional and i guess probably some form of editor or cover designer they might be the two uh experts they need towards the end of their first book yeah for sure um so the first thing is you need to log in uh all our profiles are behind behind a login wall so you just got to sign up uh it's free and it takes a few seconds and then you immediately land on the marketplace and there there are some obvious filters you can use right uh, you've got editing design etc the main categories then the sub filters for each genre like for example developmental editing copy editing proofreading and then the genre these are the main things that people use to filter their search and look for profiles one thing i also recommend that not a lot of authors do is uh using the keyword search that we have in there so we've got a, a search bar uh, below all these filters where, for example, if, if you've written uh, a book on martial arts, you could type in martial arts. Obviously, it's not a category. It's not a genre you can select because it's very niche. It's very specific. Uh, but that's something you can search for. If you've written, I don't know, um, paranormal romance that specifically has like bear shifters, 
you could add in bear shifter as a, as a keyword. Uh, and so that we're going to run a search, an elastic search throughout all the professionals' profiles who match your your filters, and we're going to return all the people who in their profile have one of those have have those keywords. Uh, generally, they're going to be in the books that they've edited or in their description or things like that. So for specific um, specific experience or specific topics or subgenres, you can use a keyword search just because otherwise, if you search for paranormal room and civil mental editor, you might get 50 or 70 profiles. And that can be a lot of profiles to go through. Um, obviously, pay attention to the reviews that they get. Um, and then try to identify titles in their portfolio that are close to yours. Um, and that's it. Make sure that you, that you at least request quotes from two, three different professionals. We always recommend five just because professionals are busy uh, and they might not always be able to meet their timeline. So if you reach out to five editors for quotes, maybe two of them are just going to decline right off the bat because they cannot work within your timeline or they're not interested in your book or anything. So at least try to be able to get two, three quotes that you can compare. Uh, but maybe you have other tips since you you actually did this search on Reetsy for an editor. Yeah. So, well, the only thing I would say is that um, in narrowing down their their experience, that's good. But if you, as long as you've got a good choice and you can look at their reviews, because this reminds me a little bit of my old computing days. I worked in computing, ended up as a manager there mm -hmm. in a job I hated. But we used to recruit quite a lot, and I I realised after a while we became bogged down in getting somebody who exactly wrote COBOL exactly had experience on the tandem computer that we used, exactly had experience on a particular operating system, and we'd use that to filter them down. Then what we'd end up with is potentially two people who fitted that but weren't necessarily had those other skills that you really want. They can learn quickly, right. they work with a team, they're good. So in editors, I'll say the same. So don't get necessarily bogged down that somebody has done, a, in my case, a Cold War book before. What you want is someone who understands how stories work how to grip people, how, you know, then somebody's passionate about that. That for me is a real key thing in an editor, not so much copy and proof editing that actually could be quite useful to have somebody who understands the fantasy world that you write right. in words that, you know, bear shifting and so on that come up in there. But um, yeah, that's, that must be my only tip is that really pay attention to certainly development editor wise, that, that storytelling drive that marks out a good editor, the person who wants to be surprised and needs a reason to turn every page. But I think it's a fantastic service. I'm a huge fan of Reedsy. Also, I love the simplicity and elegance of your website. I love the fact that if I don't remember my login details, you can click a button and it emails you a magic link, which I use all the time That's because right. I'm lazy <laughs> and, uh, and get in that way. And I love the fact that you have a record. You can go back and look at all your transactions, all your correspondence with editors backwards and forwards. And um, yeah, no, I think it's a hugely impressive operation and it's a great addition to the indie world so well done to you emmanuel you. and those other two who you mentioned matt and vincent vincent i should remember <laughs> matt and vincent i've probably walked past them and not know who they are now let's talk about the spf foundation this is uh something close to our hearts we wanted to be able to give something back to the community and you jumped on board straight away with this foundation. So tell me, first of all, why you wanted to be a part of it. Because I think it, one of the things that, you know, um, that makes Ritzy special is that the quality of our professionals, but obviously with quality comes price. And so a lot of times when you say, okay, in order to really self-publish your book professionally, you want to hire a developmental editor, hire a copy editor, hire a cover designer. And all that's going to cost you maybe 3000 bucks. Um, and that's a hard thing to say to someone who, who earns a low income. Um, so we obviously, we, we try to, to say things like, okay, you don't necessarily need to hire a copy editor straight away. You can just work with a developmental editor. You can outsource uh, some of the editing to beta readers, et cetera. So you, you can barter here and there uh, to start releasing your first books. But it's true that it's much harder to make it that way if you don't have that professional product right out of the gate. So when, when Lucy approached me with this idea of a foundation where um, authors would get access not only to the money to pay professionals to produce their books professionally, but also the marketing knowledge and expertise uh, coming from uh, the 
the SPF courses, that's a complete package. That's great for someone who, you know, doesn't have the money to invest into it themselves, but really has a drive and the writing talent to make it long term. Um, it's a perfect package for them. And we're definitely hoping to see some success stories come out of that. And I think we've se we've seen quite a bit, which reinforce our, our belief that, yeah, if we give these opportunities to 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 these people, uh, they can really make amazing amazing things and build really great careers um, in part thanks to the foundation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for doing that. Um, and other people have come on board as well, but I think you're our biggest sponsor on that front. And yeah, we have had success stories, which has been fantastic. And um, I'm following Jeffrey Fry with interest. As you might know, his story he came out of prison not that long ago. But, That's right. But found his his writing, his sort of zest for writing uh, whilst incarcerated and is in the period now, I think, of still adjusting to the outside world. But the foundation and Reed's ear has been uh, crucial to him making that start. And, um, yeah, we can't wait to see how, how Jeffrey and others do. So, yeah, no, thank you for that. Uh, it's a perfect dovetail, I think, as well. Um because you are the place to go for for all these services and it's a lot better than posting into a facebook group saying do you know a copy editor because you're filtering and all the things that you offer there the reviews the security none of that is there uh you might think it's a better way of doing it but for me it's not and uh i've 100 would be a, a would recommend reedsy in that sense good well <laughs> i'm hoping ricardo at some point we'll be in a room together again uh it just just seemed to drag on this thing now doesn't it yeah, it certainly does. Uh, at least the travel restrictions, uh, the new variants and all that. So I definitely hope to be able to do conferences this year and it looks unlikely, but yeah, maybe next year. I'm planning a bunch of conferences for next year. Um, and I think you're thinking about SPS Live potentially next year as well. Yeah, it's definitely a thought so of we'll ours. See. We're still, still at a stage where I don't think we can commit to anything. Um, things still change and we don't quite know how this winter's going to go, but we would love to do something next year. Um, and for sure, we would like to go back to the uh, the big two, I guess, for us of Vegas, uh, 20 Books Vegas and Nink. Um, I noticed Thriller Fest have announced their dates there, May and June, end of May, early June, which is a bit of a departure for them, but earlier in the year. Sort of mm -hmm. feeling that lots of people might do lots of conferences next year because it's been it's been hard being locked up. Yeah. It's been harder yeah, for me it than it is you. You're in Ibiza now. Well, you're in Madrid now, but you're in Ibiza, I believe, you were saying off air, you've moved to, and I'm in grey old Cambridgeshire in England. <laughs> Slightly different. That's true. That's true. Uh, I I can't complain, but yeah, it's. I think as as authors, uh, most authors, you know, it's a solitary profession sometimes. So being able to catch up with other authors in person and discuss things, get a drink. I think that's the best thing about conferences uh, and it's really helpful both for us industry people um, and us authors as well because we're authors as well yeah uh, it's it's really it's really important and it's really refreshing so I'm definitely looking forward to the next conference yeah we should say you have published a book I think since we last spoke you've published your book yes yes earlier this year in January so you better tell us about it it's got a, it's got a great title <laughs> It's got a great uh, original title, uh, How to Market a Book, which was, uh, you know, uh, carefully crafted for search engine optimization reasons. There you go. And it's been working relatively well so far. So if you search for how to market a book on Amazon or another retailer, you should see, you know, a blue cover pop out with uh, my name on it. Um, and obviously I would recommend it, not, you know, not because it's a thousand times better than other books out there, but it's free. So you have, you've got nothing to lose by by downloading it there you go excellent well, well congratulations on, on producing that i'm sure there'll be more to come uh, ricardo lovely to catch up with you as always stay safe there over in uh, in spain and yeah let's hope it's not too long maybe vegas you, will you go to vegas you think same same as you if, yeah. if they allow us to uh if we can fly there yeah i'll be at the airport on the one day before yeah. waiting for the us's uh official notice of letting us in waiting for that uh, oval office announcement come on joe yeah you can do it we know you've got it in you okay great ricardo thanks so much indeed and thanks for all your contribution to spf foundation and we will catch up again soon thanks for having me james and yeah hope to see you in person soon this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer
There we go, Marks Ricardo Fayette, who's moved to Ibiza. I love Ricardo's attitude to life. He, at the beginning of lockdown, he thought, I don't want to be locked down in Madrid in a flat. I'd like to be locked down next to the beach. So he moved, just moved to Ibiza. He lives in Ibiza now near the beach. And um, and that's if there's going to be another lockdown, he can go strolling there. So we should go and visit him because that's definitely somewhere we should uh, we should go to. You and I can take our clubs, can't we? And I'll yeah. take my bike. There's a lot of cycling in Ibiza. And mm. I think um, he, he said Emmanuel's into his cycling. But he hasn't quite succumbed yet. Um, but yeah, we're a lovely guy. Um, and Reezy is a great uh, a great platform, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it's a, they've they've been around for a long time now, um, and they're both very smart. Um, I don't know the other two. I've only met Emmanuel and, and Ricardo, but they're both nice guys um, and deserve the success they've they've got for building a really strong marketplace. Uh, I'm a big fan. Mm. Great. Okay, so that brings to a close episode 299. Yeah, what do you want me to say? Absolutely. What's next? Know. 300. Uh, that is what I say. God, you're good at maths. I didn't realize uh, that was one of your, yeah. your strengths. <laughs> Um, yes, episode 300. We'll do a little look back uh, and a special episode to mark 300 episodes of the show. We hope you enjoy it. Give us a share and a like uh, anywhere you like because it helps us enormously, particularly if you uh, have a few seconds to leave a review. Some of that means a, a lot to us and it means a lot to the podcast and the show. Thank you very much indeed to our interviewee this week, Ricardo. Thanks to the team in the background, John and Catherine and Stuart. And who else I missed? Alexandra. I probably miss, miss somebody. I should do a list. I will definitely give them a proper thanks and a you'll understand the work that goes on in the next episode, but I will do a list from now on because I should thank them at the end of the episode. That's it. Thank you very much indeed. Mark, you look like you're going to do something then. What was that? I just I just sneezed because oh. I'm because I'm professional. I'm muted my microphone so that no one had to hear me do it. Good. Actually, very I good. just realized I probably, did, I probably muted the Zoom call, but not the recording. So the, demonstrating how we, we'll, that could be a test for John, our editor, whether he can detect yeah, my Yeah, so I didn't hear it. it. But there probably is mm. you uh, sneezing on your mic. Okay, that's uh, that's something for one of the... Oh, John Stone. There you go. Someone else I didn't mention. Uh, that's somebody... why I said John. Yeah. Yes, well done. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. All that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from me. And a goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with the self-publishing show. <laughs>